Hello, everyone, and welcome to JSA TV and JSA Europe, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals across the continent. I'm Jean-Marc Lima, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for tuning in to, to this half-year special broadcasting series. Today, we will explore hyperscale data center deployments across Europe, and our panelists will cover a range of vital topics from finance and investment to regulation, challenges, opportunities, power constraints, sustainability development, and the paramount role of co-location operators. And with that out of the way, let's jump right in. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you our exceptional executive lineup, which includes Barry Gross, partner and co-lead of data center sector for Siemens and Siemens. We've got Rajiv Gupta, global director for sales strategy and bids at Colt Data Center Services, and Chris Baxter, chief revenue officer at Apto. Uh, guys, thank you so much for talking to me. And uh, this is a big topic. Hyperscale is a big topic in itself, uh, figuratively speaking, and actually on the ground as well. Uh, and then with the, the whole AI, revolution era age, whatever you want to call it, um, it's all becoming just mega now. Um, before we jump into the questions about the market itself, let's just do a very quick uh, sort of elevator pitch so you can just tell us of what each business does and your role within the business. Uh, and I'll go around the, the, the way you guys are showing on my screen. So I'll start with you, Chris. Thanks, John. Really happy to be here. Uh, Chris Baxter, I joined the leadership team at Apto as Chief Revenue Officer. So I'm responsible for customer care, sales and marketing. Uh, prior to Apto, I spent 11 years at Equinix, um, and there I managed the European Global Account Management team, looking after many of our, the hyperscale relationships there. And then prior to that, I spent 10 years at BT Global Services in their financial services team. Uh, so Apto was formed in September last year um, with the intention to develop and operate data centers um, for PIMCO, the Global Investment Manager. And we're designing and building uh, those data centers for hyperscaler and cloud customers, um, targeting high growth and emerging markets in Europe. Interesting. And there's, there's a, an interesting roadmap being planned and deployed um, as we speak. So that's it's one of the newest players on the continent. Uh, and then Rajiv Colts. Hi, uh, Joe. Thanks, thanks for that. I'm Rajiv Gupta. Um, pleasure to be here in the Steam company. Um, I work for Cold Data Center Services. Uh, we design, develop, and operate hyperscale data centers in flat markets, India and Japan. Uh, been around in this business uh, for a little over seven years and uh, have done a variety of outsourcing, stint with outsourcing companies in IT, public sector, healthcare, and God knows what else. So I so, don't bore you with the detail. I'm based out of London. My role here is. Uh, to drive uh, the sales globally. So I, I work uh, with my corporate development team and uh, uh, with my uh, chief sales officer and uh, come up with sales strategies to meet our targets and promises to investors. And uh, it's been an interesting journey as well, especially when you offset part of the portfolio to Atlas. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, a bit later as well um, to see the, the new concept for Colt. Uh, and then Barry, Simmons and Simmons, it's about six months into the job now. Uh, thanks, Joe. Yeah, not not even quite six months. Uh, just at the uh, at the five month mark. Uh, so uh, I co lead the data center sector team at Simmons and Simmons. Simmons and Simmons is an international law firm uh, with offices across Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Uh, and we advise predominantly data center developers and operators as well as the funds uh, and banks that, that finance them uh, across multiple jurisdictions. Hmm, interesting. All right, so I guess my first question, it's really around the, the investment and the financing of everything that's happening in the market. Uh, I mean, you can paint a bit of the picture of how fast everything is growing, where the demand is coming from, but what would you say really are the trends and how are those trends um, around investments and funding framework shaping the rapid deployment um, of data center infrastructure? Um, and I'll leave it open to who wants to go first, and then we can go from there. Otherwise, I nominate someone. <laughs> I don't know, I'm happy to make a start. Um, right. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think, it, it, as you say, the growth is, is tremendous in this industry at the moment. Um, so from a sort of investment point of view, obviously, after a, a, a challenging period, I think inflation now seems to have stabilized. Um, interest rates appear to have peaked. 
Um, and with the growth that we're seeing, I think the data center industry is, is a really attractive one for investors. There are stable tenants, relatively low churn levels, and compared to other traditional real estate sectors, uh, it's still growing very quickly. That's obviously driven, as you've mentioned, by AI, but also just the ongoing digitization and, uh, and, and cloud demand that was already very strong here. Um, so I think in, in terms of trend, uh, there's, there's clearly a lot of investment coming into the sector. I think one of the things we might start to see uh, as we go forward is, is more segregation of the sector from an investment point of view. So, um, you know, depending on the, uh, the type of investor, we may see, for example, Powered Shell being a subsector um, there, and, and we'll see that continue to evolve as, as more investors enter the sector. But also, as the demands are increasingly for hyperscale uh, type data centers, um, as well as the traditional colo. And that drives longer time horizons, more land banking, less short-term development. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a really exciting time to to be part of this industry and to, to invest in it as well. Okay, and we will get into the geography discussion on what you just said as well, um, and where, where we're heading next. Uh, beyond the more settled markets, but uh, Rajid, Barry, any other thoughts um, Not, around uh, emerging uh, investment trends? I will echo what, what uh, Chris has just said, but I think uh, with the demand, uh, the competition is increasing. Uh, there are new players coming into the market, uh, which obviously is putting a lot of pressure on supply chain. So there is still a massive challenge. Uh, Yes, the costs are becoming a lot more manageable, but availability of your GCs, availability of skilled resources, uh, that pool is still very small. That remains a, a big challenge. Interest rates are still very high, so uh, that is, uh, is, is another issue. Um, Chris mentioned about uh, Powered Shell, and Powered Shell, I believe, fundamentally is taking off purely because uh, various developers are trying to shorten the return cycles and then they can deliver that fairly quickly compared to M&E fit out. That's where the risk sits as well, a big part of it. Availability of power in most of the developed geographies uh, is, is a big challenge. So yeah, I mean, um, there are a fair amount of risk which are emerging, which people are just trying to deal with uh, and then probably facing for the very first time. Hmm. And Barry, any first thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, I, would, I would agree with uh, everything that's been said. I think that there remains a, a a big gap between experienced investors and and funders in the space and new entrants to the market. I think that new entrants still often have unrealistic expectations about what's available in terms of funding opportunities. Um, speculative development is not something that generally you're going to find a lot of people rushing into because it, it needs a, a good understanding of the market. So uh, yeah, there, there is a very good headline around the amount of money that's going to that's coming into the market uh, with lots of um, interested parties saying here's what we're going to do here's how much money we have released for it but actually it's not quite as easy to get your hands on that money if you if you're looking to uh to to borrow uh because they, they tend to be seeking very specific product um which is very much at the uh at the low risk end of the of the spectrum uh, and i think that that's going to continue to be that way for for a for a long time uh, the money is there, but I, I think that there tends to be a a higher expectation in terms of risk equity than perhaps some in the market would would like. Hmm. And, and I think often as well, when we hear about these new projects coming to market, we talk about the capex side. We don't really talk too much about the opex side. Do you guys see the market understanding the side, the investment side of the market, understanding that there is a long term commitment to keeping the facilities running? Or, or is it a conversation that doesn't need to happen that way because it will come down to revenues and how the the, the business almost finances itself at some some point? I mean, I think um, one of the things. Sorry, go on, Rajiv. No, I was just going to say I think uh, that there's a lot of it which is not actually recognized within the capex cycle. Uh, Jao, I mean, forget about going to the opex. Uh, fundamental issue is is uh, you. Uh, 
apportion a pot of money against known risk largely and how to manage them. If, if uh, as a new entrant to the market, you do not recognize certain risk, you will not be able to basically but put the funds against that, whether that is a capex or an opex cycle. And then the other thing is, is uh, uh, there was a mention about uh, doing a core and shell of risk. Uh, problem with that is the change, cost of change in this industry is very high. So if you do something which is gonna be requiring to be changed by to meet a customer requirement that cost can be very high and that does come a big shock to a lot of people who have not been in data center development previously yeah, the, the bill rapidly adds up it <laughs> Barry, does. you're going to say something as well yeah it was sort of an observation i mean if you look at the more stabilized asset side where, where you might expect the the financing to be on say a a, a longer term basis uh, the reality is what whilst the the terms are are longer uh the the propensity to repaper those deals is quite high they, they, they tend to be changed quite a lot during the life of the of the loan and that could be for all sorts of reasons it's because potentially expansion opportunities or um, it could be changes in, in in occupiers. It can be we we want to bring new properties into the loan or take or take them out. Um, so I think that, that there is constant change, regardless of whether you're looking at a, a development pipeline or whether you're looking at a, a stabilized asset pipeline. Hmm. Interesting. And, and Grace, how do you see that from a, like a new entry to the market almost? Um, you've been around for a year now, sorry, I think you mentioned. Yeah, so it was September last year, the company was formed. But um, yeah, personally, I've, I've been in the in the data center space for probably 12, 13 years. And I think well, I'm into company, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah what, I think what we're what we're seeing is increasingly um, the demand from hyperscalers is for self operated. Um, so I think it's a it's a relevant question. And there will be scenarios where we look at operated sites. Um, but yeah, it, it increasingly for the sort of scale um, that the hyperscalers are looking for us to build now, it's it, they are typically self-operated. Hmm. Okay, uh, I think the other big piece of the puzzle here, and we'll go more into the power side um, after this question because we're going to get there through the question anyway. But it's something around more the regulatory side, the, and then Barry, I know you talk a lot about sanctions as well, and I love talking about sanctions with you. Um, so we can bring that into the, the, the play as well. But it's the regulation. I mean, we have a lot of sustainability regulation in the EU now, in the UK as well. Uh, we have data sovereignty. We have um, the AI um, books coming out of Brussels uh, almost as we speak. How would you guys see regulation changing the gameplay here, changing the monopoly, not monopoly, but changing the gameplay um, that's happening in terms of developing all this infrastructure? And where, where are the hurdles? What, what, what's going to hurt uh, or could hurt the development of data centers? I think, as always, uncertainty is is the enemy here because it's 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 often not having that certainty of of what the data sovereignty requirements will be that make it very difficult to plan for the type of time horizons that you need to build these large sites. Um, I think you know the the huge growth that we've seen in the U.S. is a result of having one jurisdiction generally um, from a from a data sovereignty point of view, one 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 perspective. Um, I know there's some complexities within that, but you know, far different from from Europe, where country to country you can have very different public perceptions around where data is stored, where data is processed. So that I think will drive a different approach to machine learning and to inference of AI here in Europe. I think it will be less about huge mega campuses and it will be more about distributed data centers. There will probably still be some very large campuses of kind of the gigawatt. Uh, size, but I think we will see more kind of small 100 of megawatt sites um, in specific countries, um, partly to address that requirement. Well, the data nationalism and data patriotism are here to stay. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess there's a bit of a fear the way the elections are going this year, taking to the extremes, uh, this might not change so, so soon um, in, for the industry. But uh, Barry, appreciate it. Any views on regulations? I mean, Barry, I know you've got. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I mean, uh, yeah, well, um, 
of course you're gonna ask the lawyer <laughs> about about regulations um uh, the reality is that the industry has for a long time managed without being particularly heavily regulated uh gdpr was was probably the main focus and um, you know, good arguments. Actually, that wasn't really a, a regulation that necessarily impacted the main bits of the of the industry. It was more the the users and the customers that had to worry about their GDPR uh, compliance. Whereas now, uh, the, the regulation is impacting the industry, particularly around sustainability. But I think also generally, as as Chris has raised, the the, the complex area of data sovereignty and how that interplays with AI. Um, and d data gravity has has very much relevance here as well because of course whilst we all think that data can easily be moved around the globe that there is a cost to, to transferring data and i think that that isn't a regulatory issue that's purely a, a cost issue uh, for that that people will and are taking into account especially with these large language models if, if, if you want to do the analysis and you, and you want to do the the training of them if you're going to have to shift a lot of data to a campus to do it well that that could come at, at some cost so i think that will also um drive uh, drive things as well uh, on, on the one hand on the, on the positive side you know, europe certainly the eu uh can act with a relatively united approach and that's what they're doing with the um, with the European Efficiency Directive. That's what they're doing with the, with the AI Act, and that, that's a that's a positive because it, it at least balances out from a competition perspective. You're you're not forced to make decisions on a too localized a uh, a, a basis. Um, of course, the the risk is, and maybe this is a benefit for say the the UK that perhaps other jurisdictions become more attractive for certain types of workloads uh, and, and for locations. And again, there's some of that that already happens because of power costs. And, and you know, so the Nordics has, has risen, grown significantly over the, over the past number of years, but not for every workload. It's not suitable for every workload. So whilst I, my view is, yes, regulation is going to have an impact, I think it's just one thing that's going to have an impact amongst a number of different things. And, and it will be, as, as Chris has alluded to, it, it will be driven as much by where does the workload need to be? What type of workload is it? Data sovereignty is part of that. Data gravity is another part of that. Cost of power is part of that. Um, availability of land uh, is, is another part of it. So it's just, it's another piece of a very, very complex puzzle for developers, operators, customers, etc., and the hyperscalers in particular, to uh, to work their way through and uh, and make will have to be pretty long term decisions. Bearing in mind the uh, the sums involved. No, absolutely, and, and uh, we're, we're actually there's quite a few things I'm thinking about. We're actually talking about uh, life cycles um, of what was inside the data center as well. Uh, West before was seven, eight years, and uh, some people are hearing now eighteen months for some hardware. Uh, which sounds very short term uh, and quite scary. But uh, before we even get into that, and especially the power conversation as well, Rajiv, any thoughts on regulation? Because you've got real estate in uh, 10 plus, 10 to 20 countries? Markets yeah, no, we, we are in eight, uh, eight cities uh, right now. But I think in Europe, this uh, environmental directive, that, that's going to bring a lot of challenges, uh, not for the new estate which is to be developed. I think that is relatively straightforward in fact nothing which has been developed in the last three to five years uh, probably is going to be affected by that that's fairly easy uh, to manage but you have to think about there are quite a few data centers which are supporting enterprise estate uh, large banks and things like that sometimes you know we speak to a lot of customers they don't even know what's sitting in their racks right? they don't want to touch it now you want to bring that to operate in uh, a 27 degree plus environment where they even, you know, if you mention going anywhere above 21, 22 degrees, they just start shaking. Uh, what the hell is going to happen to my kid? So that that that's one aspect of it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, any change in the existing real estate is not an easy thing to do. 
and and then uh, you are then working with the live environment. You've got businesses running on those systems. So how are you going to do that? Uh, you know, uh, I don't even know if the hardware manufacturers are really thinking about uh, putting together the gear which which can cope with those higher operating ranges and what is the impact of that, uh, what sort of supply chain that is. So. And, and yeah, the existing estate, for example, in Germany has got about three years to come up to speed. I just don't really see how that's going to happen. In, in terms of our constraints, do you guys, I guess, Chris and Rajiv, from an operational perspective and Barry, from what you see with clients, do you, what, what are the power constraints at the moment? What, what's worrying people? And can this have a detrimental impact on new projects coming to market? Uh, I mean, someone in the previous session that we just hosted as well even made the point that we might get into a point where there's power restrictions, where you're not actually allowed uh, to use more than X amount of uh, megawatts or gigawatts per year in a country for the data center industry. Is this a real a real issue in Europe? Is this really being talked about in the corridors? Or, or are we still just kind of worrying about the unknown? Yeah, I think that it's already it's already happening. I think you can see in in uh, some of the restrictions that we saw in Amsterdam, some of the restrictions on new power agreements being allowed in Dublin. We've got new um, regulations coming in the UK around kind of use it or lose it to try and prevent um, companies holding on to power offers and, and actually not uh, not off taking. Um, so it, I think there is a there is a growing problem um that 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 needs to be addressed at, at a kind of country level and also a regional level it's not always a power generation problem it can be a power transmission problem as well and i think partly where the the the, the shift towards ai may help this slightly if you think about traditional um traditional compute hubs are typically not where renewable or abundant power is being generated so if you think about Kind of a frankfurt or a london it's it's not where you're getting a lot of renewable power um locally uh, that would be somewhere like um you know the, the mediterranean for solar or norway for, for for hydro or wind and i think the the flexibility that the machine learning aspect of of ai gives you is being able to place that compute load closer to where the the, the land and the power is more abundant so that does give some flexibility but then when it comes to inference, that still needs to be close to the users. There's still a latency requirement there. So there is still a problem that needs to be solved. And, and part of that is looking outside of those traditional hubs and considering secondary markets, which previously wouldn't have been hubs for, for, for compute or for data centers. And you know, the development that we've seen in, in, in Zaragoza, for example, the development in the Nordics, um, this is all being driven by constraints in those traditional uh, traditional colo and, and data center markets. Hmm. I, I agree to a good part of it. I think the industry will evolve. It will find its way. Right? Uh, power is not there. It's not that the industry is going to stop operating. Um, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that why is it that the hyperscalers or the CSPs are continuing to grow in these markets, right? It, it, it's the enterprises in there which is driving their business and their, their, their take up, right? These are the business hubs. So you would still need a considerable amount of power to support their growth. Yes, you, you can probably take the learning part away, but, but your generative AI, which is equally powerful, mm -hmm smaller deployment, but it is equally power hungry, which is going to fuel your cloud requirement and cloud deployment. We believe generative AI is just going to be consumed into cloud, integrated into a cloud solution effectively. Uh, that would still need power, right? How, how is that going to happen? You, you have got uh, micronuclear reactors, sort of a technology, fuel cell technology. So there are options coming up in the market. Uh, I think, uh, the markets uh, or the regulatory environment would have to start looking at how to accommodate uh, these things from a, a regulatory planning permitting perspective, because that still remains challenging. Uh, uh, data center industry receives a lot of bad press, which does not help. Uh, I, I just struggle to put my head around it. Many times I can't imagine 30 years back uh, with all these servers sitting in a corner of an office in an air conditioned room and going down how that would have been more efficient than, than the way we are running and operating it now. 
but, but there are there are a lot of challenges uh, which uh, I think uh, the 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 governments and then the enterprises collectively uh, along with the service providers need to come together and find a solution to and uh, the markets will evolve as well right that you you still have got uh, a lot of penetration and take up of cloud which has to happen globally and that's bound to happen it mm. just is the speed of it mm. okay makes sense and then Barry, how much does power come up in conversations well it comes uh, up i mean it's yeah it comes it comes up in in every conversation uh I, I i don't think the i don't think the concerns and the constraints can be understated in in the current market uh everyone is desperately seeking power and not just seeking power but seeking it in a reasonable time scale because of course that's that's generally the issue say in the uk is not that you can't get a connection offer but you might be waiting till 2035 or 2039 depending on where you are in order for that the connection offer to be to be uh, delivered and and of course that that's not going to work from a from from a even a, a medium term um, outlook. I, I do think that the industry is already playing and has a much bigger part to play in solving the problem. Let, let's you know, let's be honest. the The reason we are where we are is because the infrastructure that we all have in all jurisdictions was not built to cope with the way the world works today. Uh, and uh, a, a part of that, and it's not the only part, a part of that is because it wasn't built with the, the data center industry uh, in, uh, in, in thought at all. Um, now, uh, uh, as a result of that, I think the industry has got to help the uh, jurisdictions solve that problem. Uh, and and we are seeing we are seeing that to some extent with these sort of I call them symbiotic relationships that are developing between the power generators and and the power consumers. Um, so obviously you've got you know your 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 PPAs, but but I, I think what's what's really interesting is how that can be used as a financial mechanism to effectively unlock the the development of um, of renewable energy. Uh, and hyperscalers have done this already, uh, as well as uh, large data center operators. What I think we need to be slightly careful of is that it, they do it in a way, the industry does it in a way where 100% of the benefit goes to the industry. So um, you know, if we look at housing for, a, for another uh, example, not necessarily a great example in the UK, but the requirement that if you're going to build housing, you generally have to deliver a level of social housing. Um, perhaps there's a solution for the industry by uh, effectively, if, if you want a certain amount of power, you're going to commit to enabling a certain amount of power that you need plus some um, to, uh, to, to, to be developed. And I think we'll, we'll have to wait and see how different governments uh, look to, to solve the, uh, the, the, the problem. I think that the industry would be well served in actually coming up with some innovative solutions and, mm -hmm. and suggesting to government. I think, you know, as, as Rajiv has said, the, the um, public perception of the industry is not great. We, all, we are all in the industry. We all understand how important it is, how fundamental it is. Um, but we, it's very hard to convince someone on the street how important it is because they just don't get it. Yeah, they they will go mad if they can't watch their films on Netflix, but they don't understand that the only reason that works happens is because you've got this whole data center industry. And so instead, I think that the 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 best way of tackling the negative persona the industry has is actually by the industry delivering solutions that make a difference to people. And, and clearly helping mm -hmm. deliver more renewables power, not simply for the industry, because I think that, that's one of the big issues in Ireland is that there's perception that, yes, very good, you've, you've, um, you've helped build a load of wind farms, but actually you're sucking all that power that they're creating. So it's mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a you know, zero sum game at that point, but rather actually finding a way to, to effectively help deliver additional renewables for the wider society. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I perception. Sorry. Sorry. No, not so go on. Sorry, just, just to add on to, to Barry's point, I think the, 
it's important as well to look at it from the demand side as well as the supply side when we're looking at where we can where we can improve things and you know one of the advantages i think ai will bring is being able to dynamically manage workloads to reduce some of the peaks because if if you can spread out when that compute power is needed and for some of those workloads they can wait until nighttime when there's less demand on the grid um, it can actually reduce the, the the amount of power that a data center needs to connect so it, there is you're obviously always managing to the peak but i think there's ways and means to to manage the demand side as well could one way of be and i'm actually i had a follow-up question but i'm going to split it into two so I'm, I'm going to split one for the industry or one for the the consumer out there so one of them would be if you guys agree with tax penalties when it comes to sustainability. Um, so there'll be some sort of metrics where if an operator does not reach the sort of metrics, they get a penalty in the tax um, kind of thing. Uh, and then what you were just saying, Chris, um, about the different times of the day, for example, that reminds me straight away of washing machines. When you go and wash your clothes at night, you pay less electricity because it's cheaper at night. How could you, for example, do something like that, that a consumer understands that? So one of the topics that we had in the previous panel as well was that people post 10,000 pictures of their dog, uh, that no one's gonna look at them, even though they're not gonna look at 10,000 pictures, but they're still being stored somewhere. How do you, I mean, is there a way to kind of bring that to the market? Like we do with washing machines, washing at night for cheap electricity. Yeah, I, is there I a way to we, make it on that front? Yeah, I think we, we, we see that on the enterprise side already, less on the consumer side, where it's just it's it's always on it's always available and you just consume it but on the enterprise side consumers can already choose where their data is hosted they can they can opt for a you know slightly lower latency but a, a, a lower price or they can opt to have their data stored further away that they take slightly longer to recover so that same mechanism can be used to manage workloads is this workload urgent now to be um, managed immediately or can that one wait until overnight or when power drops below a certain demand level so i think the technology is is available and it's mm -hmm. how it you can then make that dynamic using ai so it's done in real time um and i think it's there's also the point that there's there are i think um maybe rajiv you made this point earlier on there's quite a lot of of legacy equipment installed, legacy servers running that are not necessarily being fully utilized. So it's about how you find those servers and how you you, you manage the power that you've got most effectively. Yeah, it's efficient. Pro 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 problem is not about the hardware, right? Problem is about the services running on them. And then and, uh, it's it's how critical they are to the business and whether they have a solution around it or not. So it's a problem. May sound simple, but but there are so many things you know which are uh, related to that. Uh, you can't just look at it a uh, unilateral solution. It it it, it is. It, it, we have to have a multi-pronged approach. I mean, we're talking about power consumption. Let's look at the the heat waste which comes out of data centers. Right? All data centers would be more than happy to to feed into some sort of a district heating system, right? infrastructure does not exist it's the same as power right you uh, I've, I've heard of instances where the people are looking at uh, adjacent to data center development developing uh, farms micro farms uh, using the heat uh, coming out of the data center size so there are there are options available one are they commercially viable second uh, how to make them commercially viable third who's going to bear the burden of it? Because if you ask me as an operator or an investor into a, an asset which has been, uh, I contracted five years back, and you want me to take on the cost, uh, that is just going to be an additional cost on my returns. Mm -hmm. it, it has got a huge impact on, on uh, the, the, the gearing I have done on my asset, uh, the returns I have got on my asset, and uh, the valuation of my entire portfolio. Now, why would I do that? What What is the incentive I have to do those? So, right? so we, we have to understand there's a regulatory uh, ambition of it. There's a commercial ambition of it. And mm -hmm. then there, there, there's uh, the, the, the environmental, sustainability, ecological side of it. It needs to be balanced. Nobody's saying no, but nobody is really taking a lead on how to bring it together. And mm -hmm. I think... I mean, I, I, I think you, you you mentioned possibly using um, taxation uh, as a way to to drive behaviours. 
I, I would always be very nervous of that kind of uh, of of stick. You know, I think if we look at the the European Efficiency Directive, you know, for example, it starts at 500 kilowatts of um, of of effectively potential load. The likelihood is that the most efficient consumers are actually those who are operating at below that level. And so this the the directive simply won't catch them. There is therefore nothing to push them to uh, to, to become more efficient to, to look at how they're using their uh, their their hardware. Um, and I think that that is always a risk. The, it, the there is a tendency um, in um, in government to go for the big boys, but the reality is uh, actually. The big boys are are well aware of what they should be doing, and can they do more? For, for sure, like everyone can do more, but they are they are trying, um, and their investors are are driven because their stakeholders are all driven to uh, to to deliver. Um, I think what we need to have is a structure in place, and I I openly admit I, I don't know what that structure is, but a structure in place which doesn't look to impose an end result but rather looks to encourage constant improvement because that that's ultimately what we need to do we, we need to we need to reward people for constantly improving you have a baseline and you're going from that baseline and, and you are improving uh, because this is we, we're not going to get there by a sudden leap it's going to be by by a focus on every day just being that bit better and each of those one percent, one percent, one percent. They they add up, and they add up very quickly. Um, and I and I think that uh, it, it sort of ties into what you're saying, Rajiv. It, it, it's it's a complicated mix of things, and lots of different knobs and levers. We all know where we're trying to get to. What we just need to do is to, is is to play a bit around with the with the levers, just to ensure that we're we're, we're going. Towards the right behaviors, and I think the 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 challenge, a big challenge, is that everyone just wants the headlines. Headlines yeah. don't deliver change. They might look good, but a week later, there's a different headline. Uh, and what we actually need is is a system which rewards and encourages change. Hmm. It's it's action at the end of the day. Um, yeah. So, Rishi, you're going to say something. No, no, I'm just, I okay. can't agree more. No. Well, and then I was going to, because I know we're getting to the last leg of our conversation as well. I just wanted to bring a bit of geography. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll throw in as well the customer customer um, type that's driving that, that demand. How is all this then that we just spoke, spoke about bringing in new regions into the into the map? So beyond the flat days, so beyond London, Frankfurt, uh, and all that, how are you guys seeing the new markets coming to, uh, to be? Uh, and who's driving that demand? Uh, especially from a hyperscaler point of view. Of course, there's the big cloud boys, um, but who else is driving this hyperscale demand um, in the new up-and-coming up regions? Well, you've got the AI, which is uh, definitely uh, fueling uh, a huge demand as both in certain geographies. Um, but beyond that, it, I think it, it is purely the penetration of the cloud, uh, and and it's it's a bit of a push and pull, right? So, so uh, cloud service providers are uh, establishing new availability zones. Uh, they have uh, taken slightly different approach than they traditionally have. So, so they have gone to. Oh, I think you froze. We'll go to someone else. This hasn't happened before, so <laughs> um, please turn to maybe give your side as well in terms of an operator while we try to get Rajiv back. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so I mean, we're, we're we're very focused on secondary markets in in Europe. Um, when you look at say Frankfurt, it's it's approaching probably a gigawatt now of capacity. Vacancy rates probably five percent. Um, and it's in, there are increasing regulations about the areas in Frankfurt that you can build data centers in. So it's very constrained as a market. As, as Rajiv said earlier, it's, of course, still going to grow. There's still demand there. And there are still companies um, and applications that have to be close to that existing hub. 
but what we're seeing increasingly is for for those workloads that don't and for applications that don't the secondary markets look very appealing um it's typically easier to find land there are a lot of ex-industrial sites that um that there are re regeneration um uh, opportunities around um there is often renewable power available as we've as we've already talked about um and because of the, the vast scale that the hyperscalers are, are building at, we're finding that these smaller markets are actually skipping that initial phase that many of us went through, which is start with a carrier hotel, develop that into a colo site, then start to build larger scale next to the colo site. And it kind of grows organically. We're seeing in markets like Milan, Madrid, Warsaw, hundreds of megawatts um, being deployed immediately. So um that's a it, it's great for as i say re regenerating some of those ex-industrial areas um it's it's um it's definitely a positive for for communities that maybe otherwise would have had a factory or a distribution warehouse or some other um uh, neighbor that's maybe not as quiet as a data center but i think the um the the key thing is that there's not necessarily the supply chain in those secondary markets to support that vast scale. So having the, the, the networks in place, building up the networks of, of uh, local specialists, advisors, um, construction firms that can help build in, in these new markets is key um, because there are some, some specifics to be aware of. Hmm. And then Barry, what, what you're seeing um, in terms of up and coming? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, um you know chris has, has talked about all the different drivers that there are and, and where people are going and we're uh, we're seeing work in interesting a uh, definite increase in in the nordics not not just in in sweden but but in denmark and in finland as well um i think that it, power is a is a driver uh for for everyone and looking for where the renewables power is um but and, uh, rajiv was saying uh, it's it's the the cloud service providers they need to they, they are just growing and they're looking to deliver for more and more local enterprises um in in all those jurisdictions uh so uh, the, the market is changing very very rapidly in terms of the locations that that, that people are going uh and it will be It'd be very interesting to look back in 10 years time and, and actually see how big the, the various markets are and, and will, will there be tier two markets that actually equal in size at that stage some of the current tier one markets. Um, yeah, I, th I think there are certainly some markets that, that, that could grow. I would want to predict which ones it will be. Uh, because I think that the, there are a lot of variables involved as to uh, as to why they will grow. Some of them will, will be pure customer driven, um, but others I think will be will, will be power driven, uh, maybe to some extent regulatory driven. But uh, but I think it, it'll be predominantly customer and power driven. Well, one thing is for sure, this is probably one of the most exciting sectors to be in. Um, probably alongside with the energy space as well, because everything is changing. It's these, these are the two sectors in the world right now uh, that are really, really changing. Before we do a very quick roundup about what uh, you guys are going to be focusing on in the next 12 months, on top of everything that we spoke uh, that we spoke about during this session, uh, what would you say is one thing that we didn't talk about that's going to be crucial um, to the development of all this? So what did I not have to have asked you, basically, in other words? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, th I think we, we touched on it slightly, but I think the collaboration across the industry is is really key to unlock the, the opportunity in Europe. Um, I think organizations like the EUDCA do a, a really good job of kind of pulling together um, all of the different um, uh, stakeholders here and, and provide kind of a unified voice. Um, but there are some amazing innovations coming in. And I think some of the work that's being done in kind of research institutions and universities, there's new technologies being developed around cooling, energy storage. Um, and I think there's a lot that, because the numbers involved in data centers are so huge, even small incremental improvements can be, can be really powerful. So um, I think bringing all of those all of those various stakeholders together is is really the key. It's it's definitely around collaboration. Hmm. All right, thank you. 
Uh, well, welcome back, Regents. Um, I'll, I'll get you the question in a second, but uh, Barry. So, so I I think one of the challenges we possibly didn't touch on enough is is going to be around the the scale of it. Again, I think uh, I can't remember if it was Rajiv or Chris mentioned sort of the supply chain, but but scalability um, and and flexibility. You know, there are there are a limited number of GCs that have the capability to um, to to build mm -hmm. the data centers and, and and the campuses. And it's funny, Chris, you you sort of said oh you know we're not going to go we're not going to do these mega campuses you know it's going to be 100 megawatt or so and i'm thinking you know, 100 megawatt if we'd had this conversation five years ago it would have been wow you know uh, that, i know we're talking about well, 100 megawatts it's not yeah, uh, it's not so so i think that the industry is already doing this but but i think we're going to land up seeing a lot more around the the modular side and that will, will start to raise some some interesting uh, questions as well from from a legal perspective as well where product liability and and construction what's construction what's not construction and uh, so so i think that that is a solution to some of the challenges um and may we may see some real innovation there as well in terms of, of quick deployment uh and a flexible deployment so temporary deployments who knows uh, so i think that, that could be quite quite an exciting area to watch over the next few years hmm. okay thank you uh, bridget can you can you hear us i can hear you guys i don't know whether you guys can see me or not i'm definitely having issues with my it so apologies for that um but I'm, I'm back and i can i i can hear you guys can you guys hear me uh yeah not not the greatest quality but we we can we can get through it so i mean the final question is going to be um a quick just 12 month vision uh, of what uh, each business is doing so uh maybe chris we'll sorry we'll go around and then Rajiv, you you can still try to get the video back but then chris so what's what's going to be the focus on the next 12 months almost like a sales pitch <laughs> For the next four quarters. yeah well it's it's really exciting time for us um we we do have the the benefit of kind of starting from a blank canvas so we can very much be flexible on on where we go and we can be very led by where the hyperscalers need capacity so for us those conversations and the collaborations we're, we're having with them are really key to to working out where we where we choose and we're developing a couple of uh, really exciting projects in Europe at the moment and continuing to build out the team. Um, we've got some great people on board already and, and there's some more hiring still to do. So, yeah, exciting next 12 months, I think. Yeah, we'll be looking out for those headlines and then for the following through with the headlines as well. Uh, yeah, that's right. Happen. I mean, it's when you guys announced the project and uh, when we looked at the, the leadership team behind it, we knew it was going to be serious. So. There's a lot of things that are announced and there's no people to back it. But then there's the others that have people backing it. Uh, and when you look at it, you know it's going to be serious. Uh, Bridget, I think we've got sound. We don't have image, but so we, we can hear. So if you could share with us maybe what you guys are going to be focusing on for the next 12 months. So um, first of all, apologies for this entire technical glitch. It's completely unplanned. Apologies for that. I'm got to change the distance. <laughs> Hopefully, you guys can hear me OK. Um, um, I mean, we are sticking to our strategy, uh, which uh, is, is uh, so we've never been into uh, a massive extension uh, plan, although we keep looking at new geographies to extend in. Uh, we continue to go deeper into the market we are in, and then we want to be uh, a player in, in the markets we operate in, which uh, can make a real difference. So, so we continue to march on on that strategy and uh, build more and then develop more in those markets. Hmm. Which again, with the parent company called Technologies, um, the whole ecosystem comes together. Uh, and I see your carry is pushing for all this is just dis dis transformation to happen across Europe and beyond um, as well. And uh, Barry, final thoughts on what's going to happen at Siemens and Siemens? Well, guys. Um... Uh, nearly six months into the role, uh, we're we're already um, landing some some great mandates uh, acting for developer operators. Uh, we're we're looking to uh, to do more in multiple jurisdictions, um, as well as working closely with uh, with some of the uh, funders and, and finances in in the space. So so really looking at the the vertical uh in in the space and, and building out the existing relationships that we have and, and working for more we're we're very very committed to this space we we, we see it as the, the future it's 
it, it's digital infrastructure and and i think it's the infrastructure piece that's the most important it, it is the bedrock of of modern society absolutely and I, I guess the key word for the three of you is going to be busy 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 <laughs> for the next 12 yeah. months uh but uh, Hopefully. rajiv and barry thank you so much for talking to me um as for your home and on behalf of jsa i would like to also thank everyone for tuning in you can watch our two and a half year sessions on jsa's linkedin and youtube pages one discussing data sovereignty, AI, and sustainability, and the other looking at hyperscale data center development in Europe. With that, we wrap up today's conversation from me and the team at JSA Europe. We hope you have a great summer. See you next time. And as always, happy networking.